Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be on cinematic rendering. And we presented uh, a gr group of talks on cinematic rendering at RSNA 2018 and 2019. We had the honor of coming back. And then I put this talk together, which is some of what I showed at RSNA. And at that talk also, Linda Chu and Steve Rowe gave excellent presentations. But this is um, something I put together for another meeting. And I thought I'd share this with you. I also, though it's a little bit late, wanted to thank Judith Reagan, who helped us get started with cinematic rendering. And I knew Judith for a very long time, more than 20 years, when she worked at Siemens. And she retired at the end of December. And at RSNA, we did acknowledge her, but I want to acknowledge her again. And we really do appreciate all the work she did getting us started and keeping us going. And also, I knew Judith for a long time. And it's not like she's uh, disappearing, but she's retiring. And hopefully, we'll keep in touch. But uh, she was a, a true colleague. And it's also a good example of when you're working with companies, how it's basically a two-way street if you're doing research. And that kind of fits right in, because I think when we started working with Judith, we thought it was 3D imaging. And for us, 3D imaging, for me, is a 35-year evolution. And the things that have evolved are hardware, software, user interfaces and design, CD, CT scan data, we had 10 millimeter thick sections, then five, and then four. Now we have sub-millimeter scans. We're basically doing bone because we couldn't scan fast enough, and we did four millimeters by three. So you did skull or pelvis. Now we scan so quickly, we do everything from the coronary arteries to every vessel in the body, to every part of the body. And then, of course, the increased clinical experience has driven us to develop new things based on clinical demands. If you look back, I, as I mentioned, I gave this at RSNA. RSNA 1985 was game changing. This is the picture of the Pixar's first set of body images. It was presented at RSNA in the Phillips booth, and this was Ed Catmull. It's a reminder that Pixar could have been a very different company. Uh, Ed uh, led the company and was at Pixar and Lucasfilms for 40 years and retired in August 2019, and now is doing uh, incredible things beyond that, whether it's at Google or his book or whatever else he's doing. Now, in terms of computer hardware, that Pixar hardware with the front end of a Sun Microsystems workstation was $350,000, 8586. Now you could do things on $800 NVIDIA boards or $1,000 NVIDIA boards that you couldn't do in those days. And this whole change from hardware, the SGI days, the Onyxes, and the like, it's going to more of these GPUs is where everything's going. As computers got faster and data processing faster, we went from shaded surface, Pixar 8586 was volume rendering, and most recently, the work done to take a new form of volume rendering, cinematic rendering, and bring that front and center. We talk about the CT data sets, the slice thickness. We usually use 0.75 every 0.5 millimeters. Speed of acquisition, a matter of seconds. Dual energy and perfusion do provide unique data sets as well. And as I mentioned, clinical demand, better staging, higher need for accuracy, closer work between radiology and surgery and radiology and vascular surgery and radiology and endocrinology, on and on. And with laparoscopic surgery and with robotic surgery, the preoperative imaging becomes even more precious. And then, of course, the ACR and the value over volume initiative. We need to do better, not just do more. Now, cinematic rendering, what I'll do is I'll speak about some of the principles, its implementation. I'll show you a bunch of clinical applications and talk about future directions beyond simple visualization. Now, everything really is visualization. When I say we're doing 3D imaging, what we're doing is we're doing visualization. We're creating images that provide information that's not appreciated in the data set. Visualization is the process of transforming information into a visual form, enabling users to observe the information. The resulting visual display enables the scientists or engineer to perceive visible features, features which are, not, which are hidden in the data set but are nevertheless needed for data exploration and analysis. And that has never changed. Now, I will admit I have not been the best predictor about the speed of 3D integration. 1991, as radiology enters the 1990s, we predict that one of the major achievements of the decade 
will be widespread diffusion of the technology of computed image processing into the medical community. It did move forward, but not to the speed I thought. And 15 years later, radiologists must embrace this paradigm shift from traditional axial slices to primary 3D visualization in order to efficiently and comprehensively review large data sets and ultimately improve patient care. Again, predicting within a few years, 3D imaging will no longer be a specialized study done on select patients, but will be also be part of a review of routine cases as well. And that's um, more than 14 years ago, and I'm still not correct. And this article published by Pam Johnson eight years ago or seven years ago, 3D imaging is critical, but we're not yet there. Now, in terms of imaging, it, images are everything. If you're good, you know that's the pelvis, shaded surface, 82. The first images, those incredible Lucasfilms images, white bone, red muscle, green fat, RGB, alpha channel, all there in the volume rendering paper by Bob Drebin, Lauren Carpenter, and Pat Hanrahan. Bob is at Apple, Lauren's still at Pixar, and Pat is at Stanford. Three of the most brilliant people still doing incredibly brilliant work. And it took us a few years, but we could create incredible images, four millimeters thick, every three millimeters, but look at the detail of muscle and bone. And we were sure that volume rendering would change everything because it gave us objects thickness and internal contours. It was a percentage classification technique, not binary classification. Tissue types weren't zero or one. It was percentage classification. Each voxel could be accurately represented. We used a probabilistic classification with a trapezoid approximation. Each tissue type had a nominal value. Each voxel was assigned a color and transparency. We adjusted the trapezoids. We created presets and then created a final image by simulated rays of light through the volume containing the classified and colored voxel and then projecting this. That's all it was. And in fact, when I talk about cinematic rendering in a moment, it's simply having more lighting models instead of the one lighting model. But with that lighting model, we did well. Color or grayscale, here we accentuate the tendons and the bone. And here we accentuate, make the skin very opaque and show the vessels in the skin with two different renderings. And here showing you better the bone and the tendons. Same data set, simply changing the lookup table, the trapezoids generate this information. Now you flash forward from that Pixar article from 86 to literally almost 2016, this article by Crowe's talking about could he make better images. Crowe's was not a radiologist or a computer scientist interested in medicine, but he was an expert in computer graphics. And the question was with faster processing, particularly the NVIDIA boards, could he use multiple lighting sources to create more shadowing and create better quality images? So this whole idea of creating images, Monte Carlo integration, and as he said, in addition to the fact that photorealistic volume renderings tend to be aesthetically more pleasing, it's been shown that realistic lighting contributes to 3D understanding and can improve depth related task performance. With this work and the implementation that we have made available, we hope to contribute to the uptake of realistic illumination in interactive direct volume rendering applications. And so you could see that's exactly what he's done. Articles then followed. This article by DAPA, it should be kept in mind that imaging data with volume rendering does not add to the initial data set but it's how we represent the data. The physically based volume rendering method called cinematic rendering computes in real time the complex physics of lighting effects. This approach leads to a natural and physically accurate presentation of the medical data with a focus on an encased depth and shape perception. So it's making things better. We then started doing some work and you can see this from 2017, we start in 2016. Cinematic rendering produces volume rendered images with photorealistic image quality. The result of the integration is a numerical rendering algorithm known as path tracing. Thousands of light rays are traced to compute the resulting image. We 
Pam Johnson then said that the light model of which the cinematic and classic volume renderings are based accounts for the differences. The primary reason why classic volume rendering results in images that are relatively less photorealistic is the use of a local lighting model. Inversely, cinematic rendering assumes a global illumination model, which accounts for the impact that all rays have on image representation. So more light sources give you more information, it gives you more accurate image. That's the bottom line. The limitations of cinematic rendering must also be acknowledged. Again, one of the challenges is uh, it's easy to show things better, but it's also easier to hide things. One of the things with processes like cinematic rendering is kind of like the news. You want to make sure you don't have any fake news. You don't want to create something that's not there. Our job is simply to show the information that's there and show it accurately. The last thing you'd want to do is create information that's not there. So how do we do that? How do we create images? So we need to do things in a way that I could not do one case, but I could do lots and lots of cases on a daily basis. So we create trapezoids to optimize the visualization. We learned this from classic volume rendering that if we can create trapezoids, they get you 90% of the way there. So you press a button and you're almost there and maybe you do a few little adjustments. That's incredibly efficient. So we create presets to speed up, also as a way of taking people who are less experienced and get them working. And then we interactively change those presets on an individual basis, but again, knowing that we're trying to optimize. So it takes experience, but also the use of presets makes life easier. So here's presets that I've generated, and you can see one thoracic aorta, heart, liver map, so you can see them, and I could choose them on any case. I could then adjust them. You can see, again, we create trapezoids, but I don't start from scratch on every case. I start from what I have. I have over 120 presets, maybe over 150, whether it's for pancreas or bladder. Some things like pancreas may have 10 presets, depending on what I'm looking at, depending how the ejection is, and depending the format of the information. So we have many, many presets. And again, this makes our life very easy. So right now, I probably could do any case surely under five minutes from start to finish and probably do it a lot faster than that. So the presets really are what controls a lot of our productivity. So some common questions people ask us. Well, here are the answers. There are no special protocols for the data sets when you do cinematic rendering. We scan the way we always do. We try to do low dose studies. Protocols do not change. I, the radiologist, do the processing under five minutes. The times it takes a little bit longer is I'm taking too many pictures, which is more for my interest, but five minutes or get the next pizza free. So what are the proven clinical applications? Well, they're GI apps from stomach to bowel to colon to pancreas to liver spleen. There's GU apps, kidney, adrenal, bladder, vascular apps from the heart to the runoff studies to the mesenteric vessels to everything in between to musculoskeletal whether you're talking about trauma or oncology or reconstructive surgery i think the point is there is no limitation to the areas we could look at and so now what i'll do is i'll spend most of my time now showing you some practical applications and some of our results i'm also going to show you visualization so here's a patient for tracheal stenosis there's a little bit of irregularity at the anterior tracheal wall. But look at the 3D renderings I have here. Look at the detail of the vessels of the submandibular region, the muscle, as well as any of the nodes that are present. I can change. Here's the same view. I'm just changing the lighting model to show things with different shadowing. Image on your left shows the submental region a whole lot better. Or here, again, targeting down, looking at the submandibular region, looking at the vessels, looking at the muscle, and then doing this in an interactive format. So you'll see here that we're able to simply uh, look at the images, not just as static images, but as motion. So I can look at the images, rotate, film it, save it, and send it to the referring physician. I could change any of the parameters as I'm doing the rendering, and I'm doing this in real time. So in a sense, what you're doing is creating the ability to look at things in real time and optimizing the visualization. And that becomes indeed very, very critical in practice. 
And so in this case, there's a large mass, the left neck. Those are large nodes by the jugular vein and carotid artery in a patient with T-cell lymphoma. You can see here is the coronal. You can see the mass extends down to the supraclavicular zone. Well, here it is. Left is some swollen neck in a classic volume rendering. Image on your right is volume rendering with cinematic. You see the induration of the nodes in the left supraclavicular zone. You see the increased vascularity. You see it as I give you additional images from AP and lateral projections. And here's a view from directly above. So you can get a feel of how detailed the vessels indeed are. You can see here, I can create a series of images. Again, look at some of the parotid gland. Again, accentuating vessels, accentuating the muscle mass. And you can do it anterior or posterior, any projection, any visualization. We then look at other areas. So let's look at some areas. We did some work on the heart. Cinematic rendering is a promising method to enhance volume, uh, volumetric data display. We talk about some of its advantages compared to classic techniques. We talk about the ability to look at complex relationships. So in this article, we've published stuff on looking at aortic aneurysms and traumatic aneurysms and ductus aneurysms. This was the 2017 and mini case of the year. Patient had chest pain. You see that we're doing a gated study. You can see as we go th through the ribs, you can see beautifully the arch and branch vessels off the arch. But you see a cluster of vessels on the pulmonary artery. That was a fistula from the pulmonary artery, the coronary arteries. Just a beautiful example of that fistula. Even though the vessels are a millimeter or less, or a bit more, look at the detail. Or here on a sagittal view, look at the left atrial appendage. So the ability to visualize the appendage. Or in this example, the ability to look at the coarctation of the aorta, dilated left subclavian, and multiple collaterals by the spine, the collaterals in the mediastinum, the collaterals by the internal mammary as collateral pathways, the dilated intercostals, and all of this very nicely shown interactively. Beautiful example here of the anterior chest wall, skin and muscle taken away where you can see the collaterals. And here you can see collaterals through the inferior epigastric. So the whole collateral pathway is very nicely shown in 3D mapping with cinematic rendering. Or this case where there's an ulcer in the descending thoracic aorta that's penetrating, you can see the intramural hematoma nicely shown, particularly on the cinematic imaging. You can see as we change the rendering, the uh, ulcer and then where the uh, intramural hematoma is. And then again, changing the lookup tables to accentuate the information. One of the things with cinematic rendering is we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of capability. It's important to use it. And here's just some more views showing posteriorly that large ulceration. Now, I mentioned we did this with ductus, we did this with um, the sections, we did this with aneurysms, we've done this with uh, coarctation and the like. Uh, this comment makes the point that one of the advantages of volume rendering over MIP is the ability to convey 3D anatomic relationships. And for complex anatomic relationship, cinematic rendering adds even greater anatomic detail. Other things, here's just a simple case of a mass, left cardiac border, that's a pericardial cyst, beautifully shown in volume rendering and in cinematic rendering. The color coding of the fluid, red tends to be fluid, beautifully shown here, as well as in the uh, hilum, when you look from a sagittal perspective, or from above where you can see the vascular map. You can see from this case the details of how I can show you all of the vessels. Now, we do have a lot of cardiac applications, and what I wanted to do is maybe stop here and then pick it up uh, after, let's say, why don't we take a five-minute break? Let's go get some, uh, some pretzels, peanuts, popcorn, and diet soda. See you in a few minutes. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.